the capital, empire of Yodin. Why? I don't accept this. How is this fair? Seated in McLean's chambers were his five wives and two concubines. Of course he used to have six wives, but he divorced the other one, Mother Winnie, and sent her and her children to one of the coastal cities within Yodin. A while ago, Sirius McLean had finally taken over the throne, and because he knew that his other sons were resentful, he immediately decided to post them to different cities that were far away from the capital. Likewise, he had also decided to send all his wives, concubines, and younger children to his personal estate at the other end of the capital. One could say that the palace was situated at the north of the capital city, while McLean's private estate was situated at the southeastern part of the capital. Traditionally, he was supposed to clear the palace and make room for Sirius and his future family. Could one imagine Sirius living in the palace with his future wives, his future children, his father's wives, his siblings, and their entire drama? That wasn't how it worked. Sirius needed his own space to grow, as well as full authority over the palace. If everyone stayed over, then some people might try to cross his path just to fight for authority. Hence with a new king here, the rest had to move out to different estates and live out their own personal lives there. The only people who would remain at the palace would be Sirius' mother, Queen Emma, who would be the new queen mother, and Princess Kendall who was Sirius' little sister. Of course Maclean would also have a courtyard in the palace as well, so as to aid his son in difficult matters. He would be sleeping at both places at once. As for his children, Maclean had thirteen daughters and eleven sons. One of his daughters had died when she was just a year old, while his other daughter and son had been disowned alongside their mother last year, so that only left him with eleven daughters and ten sons. With six wives and two concubines, over the past few years, Maclean would pregnate three or four in one year's time, and maybe in the next year he would pregnate none. In fact, some of his children were just months apart. Anyway, amongst his daughters, for were already married out, three were already above the age of fifteen and had their own private estates in the capital, while the rest were under the age of fifteen. As royal children, they were entitled to their own inheritances. Hence Maclean had announced their inheritances, as well as given out written documents to them during the coronation ceremony. Of course, they would only be able to access their inheritances when they turned fifteen. His daughters would be given their estates, as well as their monthly salaries and guards. And when they finally got married, the palace would stop giving them salaries, since their new husbands were supposed to provide for them. Also, they could still keep their estates as well, since there was nothing wrong for one to have several homes. As for their dowries, it was already prepared and stored within the palace safe. When it was time, they would get what rightfully belonged to them. Now for his ten sons, eight of them had already reached the age of fifteen and currently have their own cities to run which were far away from the capital. Long ago, Maclean had already prepared for Sirius to rule Yodin. So over the years, he had been posting his sons to different locations that wouldn't pose any threat to Sirius. As for his other two sons who were under the age of fifteen, he had already prepared their inheritances as well. Well, that was all for the children he currently had. Unfortunately, if any other child was born after this period, then they wouldn't get estates or cities to rule. They would just get money from his personal pockets. Maclean was no longer a king. So any child that comes later would be treated as a high-class noble. Hence he would personally have to provide for them. In short, the palace would not be responsible for giving them any inheritances. As for his wives, just like his daughters, they would have to receive their salaries from his pockets as well. For women, money from the palace can only be given to those who weren't married, as well as the queens and the queen mother. But since they were no longer the queens of Yodin and were also married to Maclean, then they too weren't entitled to palace money anymore. Also, all guards that were given to them as queens had to be returned back to the palace. They were only allowed to keep those that were given to them by their individual families. These guards will be trained and used for wars, or could be given to serious future queens. The same thought went for their maids. They were only allowed to leave the palace with their personal maids, which were usually just four or five in number. But the other twelve or twenty that cleaned around their courtyard or made up their beds up were supposed to stay in the palace no matter what. These maids would stay behind and serve the future queens as well. In short, 
Maclean had followed the traditions of the empire strictly, as that's what his father did as well. When making him king, he too came from a large family with nine stepmothers who hated him to the core. Imagine living with all of them alongside his family. He didn't think that his wives would have a problem giving up all their knights and maids, since his stepmothers had done the same back in the days. Whether the guards had been hired two weeks ago or ten years ago, it didn't matter at all. His father had made sure that none of his stepmothers had left the palace with them, so he thought that his wives would give him an easier time on this matter. But the truth couldn't be more wrong. Over my dead body. Over my head body. What the hell do you mean by your decision is final? Ivy yelled. Weren't you the former king? Change that bloody decision for heaven's sake. Queen Sidora bellowed. You must be crazy to think that I'll give up my knights just because I'm no longer queen. Queen Charlotte added. Ivy looked at her baffoon of a husband and became livid with anger. The entire conversation made her feel like slitting his throat over and over again. Every word stung her brain, which only fueled the fire that was burning deep within her. There was a scream from deep within her heart that felt like a demon was trying to break free from a cage deep with the abyss. Every word was like gasoline to her raging flames, which made her anger build up more. She gritted her teeth in an effort to resist the urge of killing the baffoon while clenching her fists. Her face was red from suppressed rage, and her hunched form exuded an animosity that was similar to that of a ferocious beast. All she was asking the heavens for was just one opportunity. An opportunity to punch the living day light out of this bastard. How dare he? Every time he opened his loud, arrogant mouth, her anger would immediately grow by mountain folds. What the F was he talking about? In her opinion, he was definitely a dreamer. So, after so many years of fighting for power and being one of the most favored queens, this was all she was getting? She had worked extremely hard just to make sure that she would continue to hold power within the empire. But now, she wasn't even going to be the queen mother? McLean, you lie. And to make it all worse, now she would just be a duchess. Wasn't this a big downgrade from the first queen? She just didn't understand why she couldn't be the queen mother. So what if Queen Emma was serious mother? Was that oaf more suitable to be the palace's queen mother than her? And to make matters worse, the skank would still live in the palace, while she on the other hand, would have to go to an estate. Sure, the estate was a lot bigger than high-class noble estates, but compared to the palace, it was just child play. Everything about her situation spelled out downgrading to her. Hence she was very determined to stay in the palace, even if hail and snow fell on her all year round. Why couldn't they all live in the palace with that brat serious? So what if he got married and had children? Did they think that she would poison them or make their lives unbearable? Okay, yes, she would probably do it. But so what? Hump, if he was truly king, then he should have the power to protect himself. So why was he sacred now? The more she thought about the situation, the more annoyed she became. She knew about the traditions and whatnot. But as the former king, couldn't he bend the rules a little bit? Granted, she had taken the knights of the old queens when she first stepped into the palace. But why should she hand her own knights now? In her mind, Maclean was just doing this to get on her last damn nerves. Over the years, as the first queen, she had received 7,000 knights. And apart from these men, she also had 980 other knights that were either given to her by her father or bought by from her allowances. If they took away her 7,000, then what would she be left with? She had already come up with a plan to convince her husband of her knight's loyalty to her. As amazing as she was, wouldn't they be devastated if they couldn't serve her anymore? But unbeknownst to her, even if she tried to convince the knights, none of them were willing to serve her any longer. In fact, on the coronation day, her knights had been celebrating because they were finally free from their demoness of a queen. Once Ivy steps into McLean's estate, they wouldn't be responsible for her any longer. The men celebrated and kept waiting for next week to come eagerly. For them, freedom was just around the corner. In their eyes, the fact that Ivy's son wants chosen was a miracle, or else they would have still had to serve her as the queen mother. Their ancestors had truly heard their prayers. Ivy, on the other hand, was still grumbling about her predicaments. What about her money? From what McLean said, 
he would only give them 30% of their regular allowances monthly. In truth, that amount was what high-class noble wives received from their husbands. But in Ivy's mind, it was nothing more than chicken change. As for Sadora, she was also thinking about the same thing as well. How the hell was she supposed to kill Sirius with less than a thousand knights? She hadn't given up on killing that brat yet. For her, no matter how long it took, she would have to kill him, so that her son can be made king. But with the monthly allowances and the number of knights that she had left, she knew that she wouldn't be able to deal with the brat anytime soon. From the ferocity of her venting, one could see that she had been holding her anger in for several months now. Like Ivy, from day one, she worked her butt off and did everything that she was supposed to do. In fact, she had fashioned herself into his perfect woman. She acted patient, loving, sweet, and very feisty when they always did adult gymnastics. But at the end of it all, her son want even Chosinto be king. And to make matters worse, this scoundrel husband of hers had said that he had already chosen Sirius as king way back. So what was the point of wasting her time all those years? No one was more pitiful than her. When she thought about the things that she had done just to secure the throne, she couldn't help but want to assassinate her beloved husband. McLean looked at his wives and couldn't help but feel disappointed. The only ones who were calm were Cyrus' mother, Queen Emma, and his two concubines. The rest were just acting like mad raving dogs. For the first time since he married them, they had been screaming and yelling at him nonstop. For a moment, it seemed like they had actually forgotten about his authority. Who the hell were they yelling at? Everyone will move out in a week's time. And like I've said, anyone who doesn't want to follow the rules will be divorced and sent far away. So if I were you all, I would immediately think it through and stay humble. This is my final warning to you all. Except for Emma, everyone else should get out. Today, the seas were somewhat calm, flat, and emotionless. When compared to yesterday's wild and unrestrained currents, Landon was currently laying down on his cabinet bed when he got a sudden notification from the system. Congratulations, host, for completing your mission. Landon opened his eyes and a hint of surprise flashed through his eyes. He was still on his way back to Baymard, so he was somewhat astonished that he would receive his rewards when he was away. It seemed that the system would reward him if his task was completed, no matter where he was. Before leaving Baymard, he had already completed two-thirds of the mission, which was to create drugs, pass down medical knowledge, and to do all surgical procedures on patients. With the aspect of passing knowledge on, the system required him to start teaching this knowledge now, as one couldn't know everything about biology, pharmacology, and so on, in one go. Knowledge like this would take more than five years to digest. Hence, he was only required to start teaching the people. So last October, he had first taught the teachers everything they needed to know for the upcoming semester. And by January, those teachers in turn taught the medical and healthcare students as well. Hence with regards to knowledge, Landon had already completed this task way back in January. As for surgery, he had already performed all six main surgical procedures in the hospitals and had also taken his time in teaching the doctors and nurses on what to do. Of course, after treating live patients in their presence, he had allowed them to do the same surgeries under his supervision over 50 times a month. The doctors had delivered babies in his presence, and so on. In fact, while the workers were focused on development, Landon had become a full-time doctor during the winter and had spent his days in the hospital all day long. And by the time he had left Baymard for this mission, those particular mission was marked as complete by the system's standards. So the only thing that took his time was creating drugs. There were some raw products that Baymar didn't have or grow yet. Hence, they could only wait for Santa's ship to bring them forth. For example, some products were abundant in other empires like Terry K and Yodin. So Landon had requested for the seeds to be bought, as well as bags of raw materials too. And even though Corona was generally a month's travel to Baymar by sea, depending on coastal port, other empires were not. Sometimes it would take two to four months for something Landon ordered to arrive. And due to this delay, he could only take his time when creating these drugs. But now, with the system's notification, it seemed that the remaining set of drugs had finally been created and sold to the citizens. With this, his mission was finally accomplished. Would the host like to receive his rewards now? 
Or would the host like to see his stats first? The system said without any hint of emotion in its voice. Show me my stats first. Landon replied while rubbing his chin. Yes, host. Straight away, a large screen appeared before him. Host name, Landon Barn. The age, 16. Status, King of Baymard. Level, somewhat of a novice. Level 2. Current situation, healthy. As well as teach the people on all beginner and intermediate knowledge that host has received. Mission status, completed. 10 other surgical procedures. Advanced knowledge on biology only. Five other drugs for the host to produce. Five random medical techniques for treating patients. Recipes to make 10 different classic alcoholic and non alcoholic beverages from Earth. Lastly, 500 development points, DP, and 3,100 technology points, TP. For creating printing press, paper money, watches, clocks, escalators, photocopying machine, Bus. The system listed everything that Landon created. Host will receive 1220 DP, 13,409 TP, and 6,700 BP. With all this, host can also choose to upgrade the system to level 3, using 13,000 TP and 4,500 DP to do so. Host's current balance is 7 DP, 18 TP, and 1 BP. The host's current balance is as a result of buying knowledge on printing press machines, photocopying machines, bulletproof vests, paper money, the list went on. Dot. After reading everything, Landon soon realized that he could upgrade again and move towards level 3. It had been over 8 months since he last leveled up, so he was somewhat happy about this realization. System, upgrade to the next level. He said while looking at his screen. As you wish host. 18% completed. 32% completed, 69% completed, 84% completed, 100% completed. System has successfully upgraded to level 3. At this level, the amount of tasks given to the host will increase, and the host will have access to more information as well. Host should note that the system is here for peace and development. Hence at this level, the host might have to do several spontaneous requests from the system based on the people's needs as well as the needs of this world, hurt Philia. Actually, Landon wasn't too surprised by what the system had said. He had already guessed that the system would try to make him the savior of the world at some point. From the moment he had previously heard about peace treaties from the system, he had instantly known that he would begin his journey of unifying the world. It seemed like he would have to purge the Pino continent, before moving on to different continents. Well, these were just his speculations. Who knew what the supposed gods were up to? From what the system had said, his 100 years here would be like a two-hour movie up in the heavens. So as far as he was concerned, he was still an unpaid movie star in their sick show. After listening to the system for a while, Landon decided to focus on his rewards for the time being. Would host like to receive his rewards now? Yes, Landon replied. Straight away, a sharp pain pierced through his brain as if something was trying to hurriedly claw its way in. Ah. The pain only lasted for not more than 38 seconds. And after that, Landon's mind had completely eased up. And after 43 minutes of digesting everything, he slowly opened his eyes, sat up from his bed, and massaged his temples in a soothing manner. From his reward, he was given. Advanced knowledge on biology only. Five random medical techniques for treating patients. Five other drugs for the host to produce. Ten other surgical procedures which included four bone marrow procedures, two dental procedures, two neck procedures, and two waist procedures. 500 development points, DP, and 3,100 technology points, TP. And lastly, recipes to make ten different classical alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages from Earth. Vodka. Dom Perignan 2002 roku. Champagne. Oplaga, Pia. Corona Light, Beer. Fanta, Yellow Colored One. Classical Red Fruitopia, Bright. Grape Juice. Cranberry Juice. Apple Juice. When Landon saw the list of drinks rewarded to him, he almost jumped from pure joy. The drinks which were given by system could be placed in five main categories. Liquor, beer, wine, soda drinks, and juices. Ah, he had missed some of these drinks dearly. In short, 
The system had catered to all age groups, which was what he had been hoping for. Right now, it would take two more weeks before he arrived at Baymart. So his plan was to start producing at least one of each beverage category before July began. From the ship's speed, if nothing unexpected happened, he would be in Baymart by the third week of June. Bottom story, he needed some of these drinks made before Santa arrived. And from what Santa had told him, they would be arriving around the last week of July. So that gave him plenty of time to get things done before their arrival. Also, it seemed like he would continue his routine of being a part-time doctor, as he now had new surgical procedures to do, as well as new drugs to create. Once he had absorbed everything in, he immediately clicked on his mission tab and read through it quietly. Main mission, host should produce all 10 beverages given by the system, as well as perform all surgical procedures, produce the drugs needed for the patients who undergo those surgeries. Side mission, sign a peace treaty with the Empire of Corona and aid them in training their soldiers in physical combat only. As for the peace treaty, the system has already sent the terms of the treaty into the host's item box. Rewards Host will also receive recipes to make five classic snacks like Lay's and Cheetos from Earth. Host should know that beauty also plays a great part in development. The world here uses unsafe beauth products here, which is detrimental to their health, like adding iron fillings to their powders and even drinking some unsafe portions to stay young and reach immortality. Hence, the system will reward the host with the exact formula for creating two types of lip glosses, five colored lipsticks, and two types of shampoos. Host will still receive 10 medical procedures, as there are at least 3,500 surgeries procedures that the host needs to do before he dies. Host will also receive instructions for producing five other drugs as well. And lastly, the host will also receive 700 development points, DP, and 4,300 technology points, TP. Deadline. No specific time required for completing the main mission. As for the side mission, the system is giving the host 5 months max to get it done. Failure to complete the side mission on time would result in the destruction of the host's soul. Landon looked at the side mission and felt a headache coming along. It seemed like the gods had demanded for him to form a treaty with Corona. Honestly, he didn't have a problem with that, since he felt like they were his kind of people. But what if they refused? Wouldn't that mean that his soul would get blown away into smithereens? Sigh. There was no use thinking about it now. The system wanted it done, so he had no say in the matter. He quickly opened the treaty in his item box and quickly scanned through it. There were over 50 rules listed there. But all these rules were acceptable to Landon. It banned rape, slavery, murder, fraud, and other illegal acts. It also stated that if they had tough prisoners in their empire, then Landon would have to keep these prisoners in Baymard for the time being. It seemed like the system was hinted for him to use the maximum security prison that was still under construction. Bruh. Also, the treaty talked about training their knights in combat only. Well, that was understandable as most of these people weren't flexible at all. If one had to describe them, Landon would say that they were more like musketeers who were great with swords. But, if one compared a musketeer to a secret agent like Black Widow who could fight, was flexible and quick-witted, then sorry, the musketeers were trash. Landon could also understand why the system only wanted them to train in close combat. This was because Corona had no way of making sure that weapons like guns, never reached their enemy's hands. Just based on the situation with Nopline, Landon was sure that the Empire had spies that even worked in the government. So if these weapons got distributed, won't Nopline and other criminals get their hands on them as well? Until evil is purged, and the entire world signs a peace treaty, these weapons weren't allowed to reach any one nation's hands. Landon sighed and massaged his tired brain. As the supposed savior of the world, he still had a long way to go from achieving his goals. Of course, while superhero Landon was thinking of how to save the world, Santa, on the other hand, had just arrived at the capital and was quickly making his way to the palace. He had to tell them about Nopline. Why are you so late? The capital, the Empire of Corona. Santa stood at the hallway powerlessly as he looked at his fire-breathing wife. All his feelings of excitement had been thoroughly washed away by her cold aura. He couldn't help but smile bitterly as he continuously perspirated under her intense glare. So why are you so late again? Lie to me and you're dead. 
said the stunning beauty before him. Santa looked at his future father-in-law, Carmelo, and grandfather-in-law, Adrian, who were currently standing besides Penelope, and hinted for them to help him out a little. But to his dismay, the shameless duo kept looking upwards as if deep in thought while pretending not to his his gestures. Brat, are you trying to get us into trouble? Since she's your future wife, isn't it only right for you to deal with her? Erm, wifey can we talk about it inside? He said helplessly. Sure, but only if you can make it to my study in one piece. Penelope said, while drawing her sword from her sheath. Shing, wait, 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 let's talk about it all right, Santa said, as he tried to calm his fire-breathing fiancé who was now running towards him at full speed. His subordinate immediately handed a sword to him as if this was a normal occurrence, and quickly patted his back as if saying, good luck bro. He didn't know whether to laugh or cry at the welcome party he had received after aiding Corona. This was not what he had in mind. Cling. I wasn't late intentionally, you know, he said, while pressing closer to her face. Cling. I came late because of a mission. Cling. A mission? Well, she sure as hell didn't send him out on any mission. And she was also sure that her family didn't do the same as well. So what stupid mission was he talking about? And if he did go, why the hell would he do so without any backup? If he had died out there just like that, how the hell would she have known about it? Judging from his weak-ass sword skills, it was already a miracle that he was still alive after going with no backup. Hump. Since he had abused the traveling freedom that was given him prior to his departure, then he would only travel twice a year max from now on. Serves him right. Cling. Wifey. I know that you're mad at me right now. But believe me, I did this for Corona. The mission was for Corona's safety. Penelope placed her sword in her sheath and glared at him fiercely. My study now. With that, she turned around and walked silently, and her faithful husband followed behind her pitifully. Carmelo and Adrian followed the duo, while sighing and shaking their heads wryly at the young couple before them. Santa was indeed perfect for their adorable princess. She was the dominant one, while he was the passive in their relationship. Bang! So, those three city lords are working with Nopline, Carmelo said angry while hitting his hand hard against a table. He was fuming with rage at the thought of all the illegal activities that had been going on within his empire. Previously, he had thought that he did a marvelous job as king, but now, he knew better. Based on what Santa had said, for eight years, these people had built and used these underground camps right under their noses, hence making a fool out of him and his family. And to make matters worse, all these city lords had sent letters to to Penelope, talking about their own made-up stories about the occurrences around their cities. Those city lords had claimed that several innocent women and children had died from those disasters. And due to this, they had requested for a ton of money to pay off the families, and many more requests. Fortunately, they hadn't sent anyone to investigate the issues yet. Since they had just received these letters a few days ago, if these city lords dared to lie to them, then meant that they could also threaten people to act like they had lost their family members as well. Adrian was also pissed off as well. In short, he had already made a mental note to deal with them in the nearest future. How dare they disregard the royal family's orders just to feel up their pockets? It looked like he would have to pay these places a visit real soon. Are you sure that no one was hurt? Grandpa Adrian asked. Yes, grandfather-in-law. I even passed through one of those cities on my way here. There wasn't any damage to the city, as well as the main roads. The phenomenon only occurred around the forests. No innocent citizens died, just the guards who were guarding those underground camps. It's obvious that they're planning to use the money they requested in getting more guards rather than aiding the people. But, should we oblige them? On one hand, if we give them money, then they'll think that they had successfully deceived us. And in doing so, we wouldn't be able to alert Nopline. But on the other hand, if we don't give them money, then they might start fearing our counterattack and alert Nopline, Penelope said. Even though they knew that giving the money was more beneficial, their hearts were still heavy at the thought that they would be giving criminals the citizens' hard-earned money. Taxes collected, and most times, money could be sent out to aid those in need. The thought of giving the money to greedy nobles 
rather than hungry peasants, made their bloods boil slightly. No one wanted to be treated like a fool. So it was indeed painful to send money to someone who took them as such. Actually, you all don't worry about this matter. I'll handle it, Santa said. In fact, he had made a huge steal from these missions with Landon. So he was willing to use part of the money to solve this problem. For him, this was money that he didn't work for as a merchant. And it wasn't coming from Corona's treasury, so it was okay for them to use it. Let's go with what you said then. What about the slaves? Are you sure that this brother of yours can be trusted? Carmelo asked curiously. Absolutely. I wouldn't have even left my other sworn brother there if I didn't trust him that well. It's strange. We've only known each other for a while now. But straight away, I can tell that he's somewhat similar to me. Santa went on to talk about everything he knew about Landon. Of course, he particularly kept out details about Baymard's development, since he wanted them to be thoroughly surprised when they got there. He had just told them that he would take them for a vacation, and that was all. When he showed them the VIP passes, their eyes immediately lit up as they looked at its cool, sleek appearance in Marvel. They looked at Santa's mischievous smile and came to a conclusion that his Landon fellow wasn't as easy as he seemed. A person who was abandoned by an entire empire wouldn't have the guts to take down any of Nopline's forces, except he was absolutely sure of his strength. Coupled with these cool-looking VIP passes before them, they couldn't help but wonder what Baymard was actually like. We're going. Carmelo and Adrian said at once. Sure, but the only thing that I can promise you all is that if we don't bring my mother-in-laws, aunties, and my cousin-in-laws, then they would personally kill us all when we get back. That's why even though we have only 10 VIP passes here, it doesn't mean that the number of people going has to be restricted. Carmelo's eyes lit up and he smiled. Since he was going, then he might as well bring his two wives, as well as his sister and her family along. As for Adrian, he would be joining them alone. Since his wife, Carmelo's mother, passed away a long time ago. In Santa's own case, he planned to take his mother, his sisters, as well as their children for this trip. Of course he had hoped for his father to join as well, if he would only agree to it. The man was all work and no play. Pumpkin, would you be okay without using Corona? Asked the doting grandpa Adrian. I'm not alone, remember? Even though you both are leaving, I still have Uncle Samuel, Carmelo's brother, and the other ministers by my side. Penelope answered with a rare smile on her face. In truth, everyone in the empire doted on her like a priceless item. So she always had hundreds of people looking out for her wherever she went. Some of the ministers even took her as their adopted daughter who they pampered effortlessly. As for her doting uncle, he was the same breed as her father and grandfather. In her opinion, this vacation was a good break from some of her overly doting family members. She loved them dearly. But sometimes, they were just too much for her to handle, especially her mom. The only thing that made her a little sad was that Santa was going to leave again. Benji, you can leave and show them the way. But after two weeks, I expect you to come back immediately. They can stay for as long as they wanted to. But in your case, don't even think about it. Riverdale City, Arcadina. So you're saying that those group of knights went there but never came back? Martyr was sitting on this throne arrogantly, as he looked at the lowly hunter who had come to give a report about the suspicious men he had seen a while back. A while ago, he had been hunting deep in the forest, when he saw a group of knights jump onto the roads from the other side of the woods. He was around the outskirts of Riverdale City that was facing the direction towards Baymard City, when he saw those knights come out from the woods. Fear. Fear quickly engulfed him and he hurriedly hid himself for more than an hour, while waiting for the men to disappear from his sight. And after realizing that they had gone to Baymard, his fear instantly turned to confusion. Weren't they afraid of Alec Barnes' wrath? Anyway, just to be sure that they wouldn't attack Riverdale next, he had been hunting around that area ever since. And the more he kept a lookout, the more anxious he became. His entire family and their surviving generations all resided in Riverdale City. So he felt that it was his obligation to warn their new city lord about this matter. Lest those knights plan to attack the city. Pabio. Yes, my lord. Give this man six silver coins for his troubles. Martyr commanded. Five minutes later, the man had left in gratitude towards the new city lord. My lord. 
Should I send people to investigate this matter? Knight Captain Pabio asked. Martyr thought for a while and shook his head slightly. Right now, his forces were weak, so he was afraid of offending someone he shouldn't. If those men hadn't returned yet, that meant that they had successfully killed Alec Barnes' bastard son and claimed Baymard for themselves. Thinking about it thoroughly, these knights had probably passed through the woods just to evade Riverdale City. So it was clear that their target wasn't his city to begin with. He was a knight himself, so he knew how these things worked. If they truly wanted to attack him, then they wouldn't have waited for so long just to do so. They had gone through that route because they wanted everything to be done in secrecy. So if he sent spies and they got caught, these people might think that he was their enemies. With his current strength, he couldn't afford any battles at the moment. Hence he would investigate the matter thoroughly. But not right now. A month from now, send even Shylock to look into this matter. By then, those men would have properly settled down in Baymart. So it should be fine to just stroll into the town as usual. But in the meantime, keep an eye out on the roads leading to Baymart, as well as the forest region, just in case they plan to launch any attacks on us. Even though we're weak right now, that doesn't mean that we'll welcome any threats whatsoever. Time passed by quickly, and just like that, Baymard had entered the third week of June, and Landon was finally back. Welcome back, your majesty, said the soldiers, who were around the harbor. Landon looked around and smiled. Everything looked as it should be. When they were closing in on Baymard from the ocean, they could see several buildings and structures on each coastal district, with most buildings having a huge arrow sign on top of them. All the arrow signs pointed towards District I, which was where the visitors, merchants, and fishermen were supposed to be. The arrows were so massive that only a blind person would miss them, and based on what he said prior to his departure, those arrows should light up at night like all those Las Vegas signboards back on Earth. Standing on the transformed harbor, Landon couldn't help but nod in satisfaction. Yup, it was perfect. The workers had already removed all those old rusted wooden stands and had replaced it with steel and concrete. For the harbor, Landon had chosen the most common and well-used harbor designs back on Earth. The general outlook of it would be like a giant octopus. Now, one could imagine that the octopus's rectangular head and body region was where the offices, police stations, and so on were. But its tentacles that stretched into the ocean was where the ships would have to dock once they arrive at Baymart. So that was generally how harbors were like. From the land, people would build bridges that stretched into the ocean, and ships would lock alongside these bridges to create more room for others. Of course, with how huge the harbor was supposed to be, the workers had only done one-fifth of the work so far. But this amount was enough to host at least 80 massive ships at once. They had been working on this harbor for three months now, so Landon thought that it was okay. Again, these bridges would have branches at different points, so as to accommodate more ships in future. One long bridge had five branches making the bridge look like a tree. Each branch could dock four massive ships on both sides, two to its left and another two to its right. And apart from these branches, there was still space along the main bridge to dock six more ships on it. So in total, each main bridge along the harbor could dock a maximum of 26 massive ships on them. Hence building these bridges were top priority when creating a harbor. And so far, the workers had only been able to build three of these bridges ever since departure. Oceans, seas, and lakes were often beautiful, but they weren't necessarily convenient places to build things. Most tools and construction materials, not to mention the labor force, work better in the dry. And yet, Many infrastructures humans depended on, like dams and bridges across the seas, were constantly being built back on Earth. So, how did they do it? Simple, they dewatered around the chosen area for these projects. Of course, there are many dewatering techniques that we commonly used back on Earth. But since Baymard's docks weren't being built far into the ocean, then the simplest technique could be used here. Of course, if it were bridges that spanned for miles across the water then that would be a different matter in its own altogether. In Baymard's case, the workers dumped soil into the water until it was tall enough to create an embankment around their chosen area, hence making some sort of fortress. From there the water inside the fortress got pumped out, and the workers quickly placed steel sheets around the fortress for additional support to the sand. 
Of course, since soil is somewhat permeable, the workers had to constantly pump the water out so as to keep their fortress dry. And from there, they drove the heavy machines to the bottom of the ocean fortress floors and got to work ASAP. Once the workers finished creating the cemented dock bridges, they immediately cleared out and got on top of the newly built bridge. From there, heavy machines like cranes carefully removed all those steel sheets that were keeping the sand embankment together. They also created several holes around the sand so as to let the water flow into the fortress, hence allowing the ocean level to return to its original height around the newly built bridge dock. Anyway, construction was still going on around the harbor as Landon expected at least 12 more dock bridges to be constructed before they could stop. But with the addition of these new slaves, Landon was very sure that they would be able to finish the entire harbor sooner than expected. The slaves who had just come out of the ship were thoroughly confused at the sight before them. This grayish-colored harbor was nothing like they had seen before. Walking on it, they couldn't help but wonder if they were still in Arcadina. The slaves could hear several unfamiliar loud noises two bridges away, that were coming from within a large hole around the water. Most of them stretched their necks in hopes of catching a glimpse into the hole. And when they saw several yellow-colored carriages pushing dirt and constructing the bridges, their eyes immediately widened from shock. What sort of carriages were these? Landon looked at the slaves and couldn't help but shake his head wryly. Indeed, for those who were seeing this for their first, it was the same as seeing a real-life bumblebee transformer. The feeling was awesome. After all the slaves had been sorted out into their residences, Landon told them to line up outside the residence tomorrow at 9 a.m. prompt. From there, they would be assigned to various jobs, as well as have a grand tour around Baymart. They needed to know Baymart's rules and sign a non-disclosure contract as well. Once the slaves were well taken care of, Landon immediately sent for all the supervisors to meet him here, as well as all the main government officials, officers, head teachers, and so on. It was time for an emergency meeting. Landon was currently seating in a conference room within the new coastal port for visitor check-in and check-out within District I. The hall was massive, and seating across from him were more than 30 people who were the heads of their individual professions, be it the chief cleaner, chief bank manager, chief accountant for the construction industry, or even the chief overseer for the horse ranch. Everyone was here. Great. I called you all first and foremost to thank you all for your hard work and commitment during my absence. Even though I don't know how far your individual workplaces had gone with our original plans, I'm sure that everyone must have done their best during this time frame. So once again, thank you all. Landon said while bowing to them. Your Majesty, it was nothing. Please raise your head. Your Majesty, it was our honor. Your Majesty. They all spoke embarrassingly as their hearts got filled with warmth. Which king could do what his majesty had done? Their king was neither proud nor haughty when facing them. He was always polite and friendly, as well as very patient when telling them what to do. If they made a mistake, he would never kill them or punish them harshly like other kings. He was their backbone, and they had been grateful to him ever since his arrival at Baymart. Landon looked at them and smiled, and his heart felt warmth from within as well. It's been over a year since he started this crazy journey with them, and since then, he too had felt a close connection with them as well. Let's talk about July. Soon, visitors will storm this place on a daily basis. So here's what I need you all to focus on. Let's start with food, Chief Lyor. How was the assignment? Your Majesty. At the beginning of April, we had a lot of issues without your guidance, Your Majesty. But by May, everything had picked up well and we've been improving these products since then. We've successfully made sugar, biscuits, popcorn, pretzel sticks, waffles and pancakes store packaged mixtures, boxed fried wings with different seasonings, and lastly, ice cream, Lyor said excitedly. Heaven knows how hard he had worked on these products. He only hoped that his efforts were good enough to please reach His Majesty's expectations. Chef Blake. Chef Benita. What about you both? Your Majesty, using some of the ingredients made, we were able to make pretzel buns and seven types of pizzas, Chef Benita replied, as well as 15 types of sandwiches and several different pastries, cupcakes, and so on. Your Majesty, it was a complete success, Chef Blake added. 
Good. Chia Lior. Within this time frame, I want you to create these listed here. Landon said while passing a notebook towards Lior. The earlier he made these drinks, the sooner his mission would be completed. After dealing with Lior, Landon focused on giving new drug formulas to the pharmaceutical industry, as well as giving new demands for Tim's industry. Previously, he forgot to create bicycles. But now that the thought about it, it made no sense for there to be skateboards and roller skates without bicycles. Hence he had decided to create them as well. Also, he had realized something while walking into the coastal port. There were no luggages for travelers to buy and place their things in. Here's the thing. He wasn't going for all those fancy luggages. No. On the contrary, he just wanted simple made luggages with wheels on them. In this era, people used worn-out clothes to sew bags and dump all their clothes into. For larger items, they would wield metal trunks and carry them all over the place. Wasn't it easier to roll their luggage through, rather than carrying it on their heads and shoulders? Hence he decided to make simple clothed luggage bags that were fiber-made and not hard-cased or luxury brand types. These ones were your average wheel traveling bags in Walmart and so on. With this, traveling should be made better for the visitors when they arrived at Baymart. Landon also wanted several sizes as well, from extra small to XXL. Time passed by and the meeting was reaching its conclusion. Lastly, let's talk about money. From all three missions, Landon had spent his time counting all bags of coins with the soldiers and had already labeled how much was in each bag. Of course, after settling Santa and giving the slaves enough money pay for two months' rent and their daily needs, Landon was left with auto tal amount of 215 gold coins, 21,500 silver coins, or 21.5 million copper coins. This was indeed a lot of money. Hence he decided to split it up like so. 5% stays with the royal family. 35% stays in Baymard's personal bank account in case of any unforeseen incidents in the nearest future. Things like wars, natural disasters, hunger, and so on. 30% will be kept in all bank accounts of national forces, be it army, police, and so on. Of course, since he planned on training the Navy firefighters this month, then they would also be included in this amount as well. And 30% will be shared amongst all businesses within Baymart and kept in their bank accounts. This money was emergency money and would only be used for expanding their workplaces or investing in projects and so on. This was the only time that they would have this benefit. As in the future, Landon was hoping that with more customers they would have enough money for their paying for such projects. Right now, Landon gave this away as capital for major projects. For example, prior to leaving, Landon had footed 42% of the bill for remodeling the old school estate and changing it into its new appearance. Of course, the school had also taken a loan from the bank, which covered 17% of the total cost needed. As for the rest, they paid it up front using their profits from tuition. Previously, they never used to pay for tuition. But from January this year, it all changed. Landon used to foot the bills for the teacher's salaries but he couldn't keep doing that forever. And since everyone was somewhat well-off in Baymard, then it was time to pay for them to pay for their children's tuitions. Of course, those who were orphans had government plans which took care of their matters. How else were they supposed to pay their teachers? What if the school wanted more desks, chairs, and so on? Where was the money supposed to come from? Tuition was a must. The only thing was that he made it cheap for those in Baymard. The real people who would spend money would be the international students. In fact, Landon felt like these times were Baymard's baby stages, so it needed all the help it could get. But once more international students, visitors, and customers come, then their profits would soar high up into the skies. Not to talk of the profits that they would get from all the goods that they had produced. In fact, they needed customers for their city to boom, as well as merchants who would take their products throughout the Fino continent and the world. Meeting adjourned. After leaving the coastal region, Landon immediately headed towards to Lucius' office. It was time to train Baymard's first firefighters, as well as other military forces. How do we train these firefighters? Lucius asked. This son of his had always managed to surprise him every time they saw each other. It was like his brain was an entire warehouse filled with ingenious ideas. From what Landon had told him, these firefighters were also seen as rescuers. They could rescue people from trapped spaces like mines. 
as we as aid people and animals during other emergency situations. They also rescued people from within hazardous materials, poisonous gases, chemical spills, and so on. Lucius felt like having firefighters was definitely a must, especially for the city. And apart from that, they also took care of fires anywhere, be it in burning buildings, burning forests, and so on. If someone accidentally lit the trees in the national park on fire, then the people were to send for the firefighters immediately. With radio waves and walkie-talkies around, the police officers at every point within Baymard could report these matter to the firefighters as well. Presently, the Baymard's protection forces, like the army and police station, all had several communication rooms within their premises. These rooms were filled with wires, receivers, and so on. That aided them in contacting their different office stations around Baymart. Within these rooms, they could even send Morse codes, as well as talk to each other from various offices as well. If Landon were to describe these rooms, he would say that they were very much similar to how army communication rooms in the 18th century were. Everything was too big and required more soldiers to maneuver the entire thing. On a daily basis, these rooms were filled with several soldiers that sat there for hours, as they paid attention to the radio frequency communication devices all around them. Typically, if any emergency occurred at the other stations, then they would get the message instantly and quickly relay it to their supervisors. Likewise, the police station had those as well. For them, they would wait patiently for messages from those officers who were around the city, as we as relay message back to them again. If a police officer called for backup, then they'd be able to send reinforcements ASAP. Anyway, the fire stations would also have their own communication systems as well. It would be good for them to rescue people faster, just in case a fire really did break out. So will you open an academy for them? Lucius asked while reading the notes in his hands. Yes but it's going to be short. They'll study and graduate after three years. And while they studied, they still needed to attend the classes at the public school as well. Of course, they would work part-time while studying. And when they graduate, they'd get hired as full-time workers by then. Landon replied, fires weren't the only things that firefighters focused on. They also had to take training and certifications for chemical identifications, leak controls, decontamination, smoke rescue situations, and so on. Firefighters alone had to get over seven certifications before they could go on the fields. So when they graduated, they would get these certification licenses and begin their full-time jobs. One should know that these certifications could only last for one to two years. So once they expired, the firefighters would have to keep renewing them by taking several theoretical and physical exams again. In every field, things change all the time. Hence, it was important for these men to stay ahead of the game when it concerned the safety of others. For their teachers, we'll get more warrant officers to sign up for that as well. As for the campus building, we'll use the estate that's close to the police academy. I'll tell some workers to renovate the place while they study there. That's good then. So now that we've concluded with the firefighters, let's move on to the next group. With the completion of the boot camp at the upper region and the facility at the coastal region, how do you plan to train these new military forces? Lucius asked. He was really curious about this particular topic. Well, their training is somewhat similar to that of the army, with just a few differences here and there. Landon replied. Prior to leaving, he had asked the workers to build a boot camp or an academy, as well as the Navy and Marine facility at the coastal region. Of course, with everything done, he felt like he should start training these recruits immediately. He planned to train coastal guards, Marine forces, as well as Navy soldiers. Navy armed forces were only supposed to handle water based operations. They typically dealt with any approaching enemies that tried to attack Baymard from its shores. These forces used ships, submarines, and so on to invade their enemies' defenses. As for the Marines, they were a typical infantry force that specialized in supporting Navy and Army operations at both land and sea. In essence, these marine soldiers could hop from one ship to another, capture ships, and so on. Hence, they were sort of seen as stealthy pirates. Sometimes, they could even use these ships, sail towards the shores, and raid their enemy's camp. As for coast guards, they were usually there for doing things like search and rescues and enforcing a country's ocean laws. If someone went out swimming and was reported missing, then they had a responsibility to keep searching the waters until the corpse was found. 
The Coast Guards were also in charge of port security and military readiness, as well as environmental protection for all sea life. Lucius read through their duties calmly, while nodding his head in agreement. As for their ranks, he was also impressed by them as well. The Navy and Coast Guard rankings were exactly the same, and were divided up into three categories, the enlisted, warrant officers, and officer grades. The soldiers would start from the enlisted category and move up till they were at the officer grade category. The ranks were as follows. Enlisted grade. Takes six months to move up a grade as well. E1. Private. PVT. E2. Private first class. PFC. E3. Lance corporal. LCPL. E4. Corporal. CPL. E5. Sergeant. SGT. E6. Staff Sergeant. SSGT. E7. Gunnery Sergeant. GYSGT. E8. Master Sergeant. MSGT. E9. First Sergeant. 1SDSGT. Another E9. Master Gunnery Sergeant. MGYSGT. E9. Sergeant Major. SGT Ma. E9 Special. Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. SMMC. Warrant Officers. Takes two years to move up a grade. Rank W1. Warrant Officer 1. W01. W2. Chief Warrant Officer 2. CW2. W3. Chief Warrant Officer 3. CW3. W4. Chief Warrant Officer 4. CW4. W5. Chief Warrant Officer 5. CW5. Officer Grades. Most take 2.5 years to rank up. Own. Unseaten. Uns. O2. Lieutenant Junior Grade, LTJG. Tris Lieutenant LT. U4. Lieutenant Commander, LCDR. O5. Commander, CDR. Three tiers to rank up. O6. Captain, Capt. 3.5 years to rank up. O7. Rear Admiral, Lower Half, RDML. Four years. O8. Rear Admiral, Upper Half, RDMU. 4 years. 09. Vice Admiral, VADM. 4.5 years. 010. Admiral Chief of Naval Operations slash Commandant of the Coast Guard, ADM. 4.5 years. 011. Fleet Admiral, FADM. 5 years. Let me guess. I'll be the Fleet Admiral as well? Lucuius asked playfully. He was the currently Theanly one within Baymard who could assume such a role. So the answer was very obvious. Yes, but I want some captains and warrant officers from the Army to also join the Navy team as well. They have a lot more experience when handling weapons. So I'm sure that they'd be able to lead several of the recruits in attacking any enemy ships successfully. Landon replied, What if he wasn't around and Lucius was at the city wall attacking Baymard's enemies? Then who would protect the waters? What he needed were capable soldiers that could ensure Baymard's victory. Hence he was thinking of having Trey and Gary focus on battleship wars. And since they would join this team, they could also act as Marine Corps and go on missions as well. Of course he wouldn't force them to leave the army, since he wanted them to decide on what route they wanted to take on their own. For now, he would just give them the best of both worlds. And after a certain time frame, he would ask them again to pick a side. Either way, they would still maintain their positions and would still be working under Lucius. So he didn't think that it would be a huge issue for them. As for the Marines, their ranking system was also as follows. Enlisted grade. Takes six months to move up a grade. E1. Seama recruiti, SR. E2. Simen apprentice, Salerno. E3. Simen, SN. E4. Petty officer third class, PO3. E5. Petty Officer 2nd Class, PO2. E6. Petty Officer 1st Class, PO1. E7. Chief Petty Officer, CPO. E8. Senior Chief Petty Officer, SCPO. E9. Master Chief Petty Officer, MCPO. Another E9. Command Master Chief Petty Officer, CMCPO. E9 Special. Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, MCPON. Warrant officers, takes two years to move up a grade. Starts at W2, Chief Warrant Officer 2, CW02. W3, Chief Warrant Officer 3, CW03. 
W4, Chief Warrant Officer 4, CW04. W5, Chief Warrant Officer 5, CW05. Officer Grades. Most take 2.5 years to rank up. 01. Second Lieutenant, 2 NDLT. 02. First Lieutenant, 1 SDLT. 03. Captain, Captain. 04. Major, Maj. 05. Lieutenant Colonel, Call. 3 tiers to rank up. 06. Colonel, Call. 3.5 years. 07. Brigadier General, Bijin. 3.5 years. 08. Major General, Maj Jin. 4 years. 09. Lieutenant General, LT Jin. 4 years. 010. General Jin. 4.5 years. After talking with Lucius for a while, Landon immediately went back to the castle to rest. With all those caged animals from his mission, it was finally time to add in another attraction site for his visitors. Tomorrow, he would start construction on Baymard's National Zoo. The next day, Landon woke up early and headed over to the estate where the newly arrived slaves were staying. This batch was the largest that they had ever received, and would also be the last batch of slaves that Landon would take in for the time being. They had welcomed a total of 19,498 people from all three underground camps. Everyone was young, fit, and able. With the women being all below the age of 26, while the men were all below the age of 34. 58% of the population were female, while the rest were male. During their mission to the last two underground camps, they had realized that the city lords of these places had kept over hundreds of slave boys locked up in several large estates. Apparently, these city lords had been slowly torturing and training them tirelessly, so that they could become knights under their rule. The men were trained to be fighters, while the women were typically used as objects for lust. These men were never allowed to leave the estates until they had given their loyalty to these city lords. In essence, they resembled those ancient Roman gladiators back on earth who fought and lived in the Colosseums their entire lives. Spartacus was an example of such gladiators. They were never allowed to leave the Colosseum until they fought for their freedom about a hundred times. Sometimes, they would battle each other while other times, they would fight ferocious beasts. Some had ended but fighting for more than 30 years without even winning their freedoms back. The amount of winnings needed for freedom were just too much. It was almost like the Romans didn't want them to leave. The only difference between these rescued men and those ancient Romans was that these ones weren't fighting with each other in front of a massive crowd. These ones would never be freed. They were being trained as part of Nopline's army for future wars. Freedom was not an option. The people of this world thought that it was a total waste to have men kill each other just for fun. So they let the women do those fights in the underground camps instead. Men were seen as valuable resources for power. Anyway, when they had successfully rescued some of the women at the second camp, a few had said that they wouldn't leave without their brothers, which had left Landon thoroughly surprised. He had no idea about these estates. So they quickly made up another plan that same night and hurriedly rescued those gladiator men. So of course, after rescuing those at the second and third cities, he had no choice but to go back to the first city that he had attacked and free those other gladiators as well. This while ordeal made him spend more time than he'd planned on this mission, but it was definitely worth it. Some of these men had been in those estates since they were nine years old and had never left the place since then. They had probably been whipped, bullied, and beaten by their instructors for being weak. Some had been there for more than nine years now, making them had more combat experience when compared to other. This was perfect, as he needed more military men for the Marines, Navy, and so on. But amongst these men, he was also sure that there would be many who wouldn't want to ever touch a sword again. This was still okay, as more workers were still needed around Baymart as well. No matter how he looked at it, this mission was truly a blessing in disguise to him. Baymart had gotten more money, animals, over 18 carts of free grains, which he would have probably bought from Santa, as well as more people. It was definitely a win-win situation for Baymart, as well as Corona. Standing before the crowd, Landon quickly gave a shirt speech that summarized Baymart's rules and regulations and so on. Amongst the group of 19,498 slaves, 1,207 were children below the ages of 15, public school. 
370 volunteered to join the hospital. 92 decided to be teachers at the public school. 419 decided to join the business academy for training accountants. And so on, since they were learned. 398 government officials. For working at Agricultural Council, Environmental Safety Council, and so on. 112 decided to be caretakers. 251 decided to be cooks. And 7,620 volunteered to be in the military and other citizen protection forces. From this group that still chose to still fight, Landon had decided to send 1,000 to the Army, 1,500 to Navy, 1,500 Coast Guards, 1,500 to the Marines, 800 as police officers, 800 as security guards, 520 as firefighters. Of course, when Landon had made it clear that women could join in as well, several girls had volunteered too, as they felt like they had to get strong enough to protect their younger ones too. Overall, after clearing out all the volunteers, Landon was left with 9,030 workers, which he divided up amongst all the industries and workplaces around Baymart. He sent some to the newly established oil industry as well. Ever since winter, he had specifically told them to start building individual industries for several products. Previously, oil production was a branch under the alchemy industry. But now, they had finally finished construction on its separate industry a little distance from the alchemy industry. The overseer for this industry was one of Wigan's friends, as well as the supervisor who used to look after the oil production department. So with his expertise and experience, Landon felt like he had left the industry in safe hands. Apart from the oil production plant, several other industries like rubber, plastic, light bulb production industries were still under construction. So once they were done, they would move out immediately as well. Of course, many departments like the car manufacturing companies, the weapon manufacturing industry and so on, had already moved out long ago. Bottom line, construction was always going on in Baymart, and several projects were already underway. Now that you all are settled, please kindly follow these officials and get your identification cards done immediately, as well as sign non-disclosure agreements too. 10.43 AM After dealing with the new recruits, Landon quickly looked at his watch and hurriedly made his way to the construction industry. Yesterday, he had told Tim to select 1,000 construction workers for today's project, 